God bless you guys. Huge shout out to all the fathers out there. Happy Father's Day on this special day. Just want to leave you guys with a scripture for today. And it's 2 Corinthians 6.18. And I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So happy Father's Day again to you guys. And for those who are not fathers or haven't had a father figure in their life, God is our father. Rest assured in that. He loves you beyond measures. God bless you guys. There is power in the
Good morning, good morning, Lighthouse friends and family. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there watching today. Uh, today is your day. It's our day. Let's enjoy, let's celebrate as much as we can um, <laughs> during the times that we're living in. But happy Father's Day, guys. Um, let's start off with a prayer. And before we get into prayer, today's sermon title is called A Father's Faith. A Father's Faith. So, Father God, I just want to come before you this, after this morning, Lord, just, just thanking you for what you're doing in our lives, thanking you for another day, thanking you, Father, for this opportunity to just be in your presence, Lord. Your presence is wherever you are. Not, it's not a building. It's not, it's not a location. Uh, but, Lord, we thank you for your presence. And, Lord, right now we come before you saying, speak to us. To all the fathers out there, to those that are not fathers, to just anyone listening to us, speak to us today. Open our hearts and ears to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So, uh, today I want to say is my third Father's Day as a biological father. Uh, and I say biological because 11 and a half years ago, 11 and a half years ago, I was fortunate to get a two-for-one special when I married my queen and uh, she introduced and brought Kevin along with her into my life and for that I am super grateful. I've had the privilege and the honor to have uh, spiritual children that I've been able to lead in the faith and in their walk and now just about all of them are grown not only as adults now but they're also grown in their faith. However, three years ago God, he granted the petition of my heart. You know, uh, I had been praying. My wife and I had been praying. We, we, were, we wanted a baby. And, and, and God granted that prayer three years ago. And he blessed me with a beautiful baby girl, Abigail Serene Diaz. Now, if I'm being transparent with you. Uh, this season leading up to uh, her birth and up to having this baby was a very hard one for me. You know, uh, my faith was tested uh, greatly. You know, um, even though I grew up in church, even though I know what the Bible says, even though I knew who God was, even though, even though, it was still a very trying season for me. The Lord showed me through this season how much faith I actually still lacked. I promise to come back to this and talk to you guys about it a little later. But uh, first, this morning, I want to talk about three fathers in the scripture. Three. Three fathers in the scriptures that, sh- that demonstrated three types of faith. One being blind faith. The second being faith after the fact. And the third one is something I call um, if you can faith. The if you can faith. So I want us to turn to Genesis, the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. And it says this, then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. When I when I read these verses, there's three words that pop up to me. There's three words that stick out. Now, only, and love. When, you know, like, you know, take, take now your son, your only son whom you love. Now, uh, now, only, and love. And what those three words stick out and what they tell me is when, when God says now, well, it, it's, it's, it's representing time. Time, meaning God's time and not ours. When he says only, He's asking for sacrifice. It was a personal sacrifice to give up something that you only have one of. Then when he says love, it's, a, it, it's, it's showing that it takes, a, it takes giving up of emotional or sentimental attachment if we're going to have blind faith. So this, this scripture right here is pointing out uh, Abraham is going to be operating and walking in blind faith. So before Abraham could walk in blind faith, before he can do this, he had to understand the importance 
of obeying the timing of God. Many times, God is telling us now, and, and, we're, and we're, not, we're trying to figure out, okay, probably it's a better time later, or maybe tomorrow, or maybe so forth. But he understood the importance of obeying God's timing. He also was willing to sacrifice his only son. He didn't have another, but he was willing to obey the Lord, and this is hard. The, the love he had for his son, the love that he had for his son, which we all know that a parent's love for a child, for their child, is great, is strong. And yet, his love for the Lord was greater. Can you look at yourself and honestly say that you would be able to do this? <laughs> Can I be honest with you? Uh, my answer is probably not. My answer is probably not. I don't think I could. Okay, so how about us, right? Are, are we walking in blind faith? Are we walking in blind faith? When God says now, when, when he speaks to us and he tells us now, do we hesitate? Uh, are, are we looking for reasons um, why now isn't a good time? You know, when God speaks to us and gives us a moment and gives us a time and we say, well, you know what? Tomorrow might actually be better because you see what I have going on today doesn't really fit, you know, at this moment. And so sometimes God is telling us a time. He's telling us now. And what we're doing is we're trying to find all the reasons why now isn't going to work. When God asks you to turn in your only when he says turn in your only passion, your only desire, your, you know, your, your, your only hobby, are you willing to part with the earthly things that you, that you have grown attached to? I mean, you, you can't possibly want me to give this up. I mean, I, don't, I only have, this is the only thing I like to do. You, you can't ask me to give this up. I mean, this is the only time I, I, I get a chance to relax or this, this, is, this is my only outlet. Some people have hobbies or things that they do or places that they go. Are you willing to give that up? When God asks us to put him before any existing relationship, no, you know, no, no, matter, no matter the bond, no matter how long you've been in that relationship, no matter how emotionally invested or how tied you are to that person, there are times that God is saying you need to give up that relationship. You need to give it up. You need to give it to me. You know, there are many times that when that asks, and when God asks of, of, of us, you know, we, we can't accept that. Sometimes the, the, one of the hardest things to do is give up relationships. When God is saying, now, this relationship, give it up to me. It's, it's not healthy for you. It's, not, it's, not, it, it's toxic. Whatever the case may be, if he's asking for it and, and we look for reasons, sometimes some of us even, will even go into the, into the Bible looking for Bible verses to, that, that we can kind of pick and choose to tailor to our current situations to kind of tell God, well, you can't possibly mean this because your, Bible, your word says this. Or, or you can't possibly mean this because, you know, I mean, you wouldn't have done this in, th in this story. And so, and we try to use the word out of context to tailor it to our situation, trying to tell God, I think you must be mistaken. You can't possibly mean this. You know, I want to say that I noticed something else in these verses. When you read these verses, uh, verses two and three, you see in verses, in verse two, God is saying, go now and do this. Verse three is a direct response to what he's been told to do. In verse 3, it just says, so Abraham rose up in the morning, sat his donkey. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, there's nothing in between. There's no, wait, but, but what, God? I mean, wait, uh, are you serious? You know, you, 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 what do you mean? You, you can't possibly, I mean, I know if it was me, there would have been a lot of in between. I'll say, okay, okay, slow it down, God. Okay, show me exactly what you mean by this. I mean, what are you trying to say? There's got to be some theological explanation that, that maybe this isn't really literal. Maybe it's, it, it's, it's metaphoric or whatever the case may be, but you can't possibly want me to kill my own son, to offer him as a sacrifice. It can't be true. I mean, this didn't happen. This conversation between Abraham and God is non-existent. This is me just saying these things. What actually existed was God said, go and do this, and Abraham got up and was obeying the Lord. No in-between. How hard is that? I know it's hard for me when God tells me to do things that just don't make sense. 
When God is telling me to do things that, that I, my mind can't comprehend, but we, all, we always have to take it back to the Word where he says sometimes it's beyond our understanding. Many times it will be. Just direct obedience. That's all there was. There wasn't that, but God. Um, what do you mean? Now, some of you are saying, okay, hold up, hold up, hold up. Pastor, you're saying blind faith, but what you're, what you're explaining is just blind obedience. You know, just direct obedience. And, 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 and you're right. I'm glad, I'm glad you, you thought that. I'm glad some of you have asked that or were thinking that at this very moment. Thank you for those that were doing that. Um, but I want I to I explain it to you. Check this out. You see, God had promised Abraham descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as numerous as the sand in the seashores. This was a promise that God made to Abraham. So at this point, if he sacrifices his only son, how would this promise come forth? How would the promise be fulfilled if he's going to kill his only son that he has? Now that's faith. He had faith, blind faith, knowing that God would still fulfill the promise somehow, some way. Are we living a life that we're like, even though we don't understand it, and even though this may be the means, even though this may be the means, okay, if God is telling me to go, uh, go right, this car is the means of my transportation. So if I give this up, I can't get to the destination. But are we living in a, in a way that we can give up the form, or, 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 or in this case, it's the car? Can we give up the car still trusting that God will take us to where he's sending us? Are we, are we walking and living blindly by, by blind faith, trusting and believing that even though we don't see it, even though we don't understand it, even though, you know, it doesn't make sense, we're going to do it because we know that he will fulfill his promises to us. The next is called, I call it faith after the fact. And um, we're going to look at Mark chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 22, 23, 35. 41 and 42. I know it's a lot, but you can see it on the screen right there. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Verse 35 says, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And verses 41 and 42 say this. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked. Jairus had faith. And he knew that Jesus could heal his baby girl. J Jairus knew this. And that's why he went to Jesus in the first place. But something happened. You see, in the midst of him speaking to Jesus, someone from his house came and said, Yo, Jairus, just leave Jesus alone because she's already dead. She's already gone. She's no longer breathing. So just leave the master alone. Leave the teacher alone. At this moment, at this moment, he had to make a decision, and he chose to still have faith. He chose to still believe and to still trust um, that God could heal her, that Jesus was going to heal her. I mean, at that point, he could have been like, you're right, and leave. But no, he walked with Jesus, and, and Jesus went to the little girl. At this moment, he's still choosing to believe and to have faith after the fact. Today, God is saying, Kabra kumi. Meaning, man arise. Fathers, there are some of us that have been told that our goals, our dreams, our passions, our visions, our thoughts, that perhaps that we, that we wanted for our families or perhaps that we wanted for ourselves, we've been told, leave it alone, it's dead. Oh, don't, what do you, what do you, what do you mean start a business? Oh, you, you're way too old for that. What do you mean go back to school? No, 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 it, it, you can't do that. 
what do you mean you, you want to do something? You know, and, and, they, and, and they, people have told us that the dreams are dead. Your goals are dead. I want you to know today, have we been told that? How, I mean, have you been told that? Can you still hold on to your faith even though things seem dead? Even though things no longer have life and, and perhaps it's been years, perhaps it's been decades. Can you still have faith beyond the fact that God can still do? That he can still revive? That he can still re restore some things and, and bring things to life? Can you, still, can you have faith beyond the fact? Sometimes... Um, you know, we look at things that just don't seem possible anymore, and we forget that we serve a God of the impossible. That's his specialty, doing the impossible. You know, there are times that um, even our loved ones, we pray for them, and, and, and we, we want them to be walking in the ways of the Lord, and, and perhaps, you know, uh, we, we hit a, a point where of discouragement, although never. They've already done this. They've said this. They've acted like this. And, 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 to, and to everyone around them, they're like, there's no hope. Are you going to have faith beyond the fact, after the fact, that God can still restore, that he can still reach that person? The third faith I mentioned was if you can faith. The if, if you can. Mark chapter 9, 17 to 18, and verses 22 to 23 says this. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to you, to your disciples, and they could, so they can cast it out, but they could not. But if you can, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus says to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. You know, when I, when I read the part where he's saying, I asked your disciples if they could help, but they couldn't. What comes to my mind is, are the sayings I've heard so many times, meaning I went to church. I did all the right things. I said all the right things. I, 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 I played the part. I, I, I dressed the part. I did everything I, I, I thought I was supposed to do, but nothing has changed. Nothing has happened. You know, some of us, sometimes we put too much trust and too much faith in man, in people. We put too much trust in pastors, in leaders. We have to understand that we have to put our full trust and faith in a living God that will not let you down, that will not fail you, that will not leave you or forsake you. That is who we need to put our trust in and our faith in. This man says, if you can, Jesus, if you can, can you imagine the love of this father for his son, seeing his son tormented by the spirit over and over again? I can't imagine as a parent. When, when, when you've taken your, your son everywhere trying to see who can help your child. He goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, if you can. This is the if you can faith. This if you can faith I, is, is almost borderline uh, disrespectful, I, I, you know, to say. Almost borderline disrespectful because, you know, um, it, it kind of says like, well, God, if you can, of course he can. He's God Almighty. But at the same time, at the same time, what it does, it shows, it shows God our sincere heart. It shows God our transparency of our heart and humbled before him saying, God, I need you. There's nothing else I can do. There's nowhere else I can go. This is like a desperate faith. A desperate faith of God. You've got to do something, please. If you can do anything, please do it. Have any of us ever found our, ourselves in that, in, in that circumstance where we're begging to God and say, God, I've tried it all. I've tried to do so much on my own, and right now I just need you. Please, if you can hear me, if you can see my situation, if you, if you know my heart, if you know my mind, if you know all the things that are tormenting me, God, please do something. Today, I'm speaking about faith. And as I mentioned earlier in the opening, uh, uh, 
about my daughter, and I said I was going to come back to that story. I, I want to implement uh, a testimony into my sermon. My faith was truly tested, and I want to be transparent with you guys in, in this testimony. My wife and I, uh, we got married, and we decided, we're, you know, uh, we're going to wait before we have kids and, and, you know, and so forth. Not knowing that in seven years, we would have eight miscarriages. So in, those, in that season of miscarriage after miscarriage, which there was no explanation, you know, uh, the doctors would tell my wife she's healthy, and, and they would tell me you're healthy, and, and the doctors could not explain why this was happening. There was no explanation. But yet all I knew is that it was one miscarriage after another one and after another one and after another one. And I found myself saying all the things that I mentioned before. Well, but God, I, I, I go to church. I serve you. I do all the right things. I try to say all the right things. I'm serving you in ministry. Because my wife and I were, were active in ministry, and, we, and it just didn't make sense to me. Like, God, we're serving you. We're giving up of our life for you, and, and you can't do this for me? Those were real conversations that I had with God. Because my mind did not understand what was happening. I could not comprehend why God would allow us to go through these things. Finally, Finally, my, my, my wife uh, is, is you know, when she's pregnant and, you know, um, they're checking her. And I remember her being about four months in, I think it was. She's going to know more of the details about that. But about four months in, the doctor says to us, I just want you to know that we've tested the, the, the baby inside the womb. And... Um, we want you to know there's a high probability that your child is going to have Down syndrome so that you can make a decision. I remember my wife and I looked at, at the doctor and says, make a decision? What is that supposed to mean, make a decision? This world would, would want so much, this evil in this world wants so much to, 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 to rob children of their lives. And, and, and at that moment, he was insinuating so that you can have an abortion. My wife has said, it doesn't matter if the, if the child will have Down syndrome or not. We don't believe in that, and we will not do that. We will love our child. And then we turned and we prayed. God, this is your daughter or, or your son. I don't think we knew yet, but this is your child. You know, we're gonna, you know it's just we want her healthy. We want, we want him or her healthy, and we want, we want to just, you know, um, be used by you. Now, in the back of our heads, there was a concern because we were leaders in ministry. You know, we knew that there was a calling on our lives and, 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 and having a special needs child, you know, it can, is beautiful and they're beautiful children, but it takes a lot more time. So how we split our time between ministry and this child, it just means, well, God, then I guess we're not doing ministry. I mean, I'm not going to give up of my child that needs me. Anyways, we prayed, we left, we left it in God's hands, and then the night of the delivery, I'm holding my daughter in, her, in my hand. And she's so beautiful and so, and so tiny. And I remember us being already taken back to the room. My son Kevin was in the room, and the doctors come in and tell Kevin, Kevin, can you wait outside? And Kevin gave the doctor a look like, wait outside? It's my family. Why can't I, you know? And, and the doctor said, we just need to talk to your parents. At this point, the doctors came in, and two or three of them came in and said, listen, we want to let you know that your daughter's healthy. She's beautiful. Everything, you know, came out Okay. Um, but your daughter does have Down syndrome. And they went and proceeded to tell us all the reasons why. They had, they had noticed different things. Apparently, there's a, a hole in the heart that is constant for uh, children of Down syndrome you know, when they're born. She had low muscle tone. You know, uh, she had some features, you know, um, in her face. And, and, and she, had, uh, um, she had no, no muscle around her neck area and so forth. So at this point, my wife and I, we, we heard the doctors out and they left. And at this moment, we, we, we just couldn't receive this news. We just couldn't receive this. And, and it's not, and it's not the, I mean, I, I said she was beautiful. And if God, if God you know, uh, has blessed some homes with, with Down syndrome babies, it's a blessing. Because they're, they're beautiful and they're healthy and they're amazing children. But there was a struggle with us because of saying, well, God, if you're telling us to do this, then this isn't really, it doesn't make sense to us. 
because we're not going to give up our daughter and the attention that she needs and the love that she needs and the care that she needs to do ministry. So it didn't make sense to us, and we went before God and said, God, you have to make things clear for us, and we're going to put this before you in prayer. And our testimony is that we told the doctors to to retest her in every area, and they did. And as they tested her in every area, every test came back reversed. And the doctor says, we don't, we don't know what happened, but uh, yeah, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't have it anymore. And when they went to do the final, the final um, chromosome test, it came back and, and the doctor said, oh, well, it's, it's, she, doesn't, she doesn't have Down syndrome. Now, I tell you this testimony because it's a testimony that God gave us of the power he has to, to reverse things and, and change things. You see, during that season, my faith was like a roller coaster. There were moments that I was like, okay, God, I believe you. I'm going to trust you. And there were moments that I was like doubting. There were moments that I was, I I had a a, a strong faith. And there were moments that my faith was weakened. There were times that I just didn't know what else to say. I said, God, I don't know what to do. There was moments that I went before God. I said, God, you got to do something if you can. Do something, do it. My faith. It was in this season that God showed me how much faith I lacked and showed me, just uh, just molded me of how to trust him in the midst of these things. In closing, as we discuss these three fathers and their faith, it makes me think of one more father. It makes me think of one more father. God the Father, Abba Father. You know, we know that John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But God the Father didn't just, didn't not only love us so much and that, that he gave his son for us, but he had faith in you and me that we would accept his son and that we will become a part of his family, a part of this kingdom of heaven. See, he had faith that we would do that. You know, the question today is where is your faith? Where is your faith? Fathers, where is your faith? We have been chosen to lead our homes. We have been chosen to lead our families. We have been chosen. Where is your faith? Are we leading our families and our homes blind faith? Where it doesn't matter what God asks us to do, we're going to do it, we're going to trust him, we're going to move forward, not asking questions. Are we in a level of faith that that, that it's it's an after-the-fact faith, that, you know, um, things have already happened, people have already told us things are dead, but we refuse, to accept, we, we refuse to accept that and we say, no, God can still do. He can still bring to life. He can still restore. Or are we going to have faith, the if you can faith, where, where we just get on our knees and, and, and we, it's a cry out to God, say, God, if you can do something about this, please do. If you can heal my marriage, God, please do that. And you can bring my children back to you, Lord, please do. Lord, look at my finances. If you can do something about that, I don't know what else to do. You know, his presence, his presence, his presence is is where we call him, where we seek him. When we seek him out, sometimes I know, I know a lot of us ha- have grown up with a religious mindset that it's in church. Well, I'm, when I go to church and I'll get in front of the altar, no, you can make your home an altar right now. You can both go before him and say, God, I need you. There's nothing I can do about this situation. There's nothing I can do about this or that. I need you. You don't have to wait to get to a certain place or even around certain people. You can contact, you can pray to the Father yourself. Now, it's always encouraging and motivating and uplifting when you know we're praying together. But I want want to tell you something. In that last faith, when, when the man said, if you 
can, if you can. Jesus' response to that man, his response to him was, if you can believe. You know, it's funny because um, we weren't there. We don't know the, 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 the tone of, of certain things. But imagine somebody coming up to Jesus himself and saying, Jesus, if you can heal, if you can heal my son. And Jesus looked at him probably like, well, if you can believe, of course I can heal your son. Do you believe? The question is, do you believe? Are you going to have faith today to know that he wants, to, he wants to, 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 to bring peace and joy and a stillness into the chaos of our, our lives? Today, you have an opportunity to walk out in faith. Today, we're being reminded that we need to have faith. Look at the faith of these three fathers. <laughs> Abraham's faith allowed him to be obedient. And, and it, through his obedience, his son was spared. He, he, didn't have to, he didn't have to do that. We see Jairus. And it's through his faith that his daughter was brought back to life. And then we have this man with this son, with this, uh, uh, this spirit in him and and because of his, his faith, his son was healed and delivered. Don't let this moment pass by, this opportunity to really go before God and say, God, I need faith. I'm lacking faith. It's something about a man of the house, the father figure of a home, that when you have faith in the Lord, when you can stand up, even when things don't make sense, even when the bills don't seem to be able to get paid, even when, even when the, the, the family is in turmoil or your children are all over the place or even the marriage, but when a man in his household stands up and says, I am going to have faith in his word. I'm going to have faith that I serve a God that still heals. I'm going to have faith that I serve a God that restores, that revives, that's going to redeem this, this, this situation or, or, or the circumstance. I'm going to choose to have faith. I mean, let's be, let's be honest with y'all. I mean, are some of us, aren't some of us tired of being faithless Christians? Aren't you tired? Don't you want to see the hand of God move in such a powerful way? I want to, I want to do something different today before I close. And I want to ask all the, the men, all the, all, the, all, the father, all the fathers that are watching, so right now, if you're a father and you're watching, I'm going to ask you to stand up. Right there in the middle of the living room, the bedroom, wherever you're at, you know, just stand up right now. Because what we're going to do is we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for you. Now, now the next thing is I want, I want, if anyone's in the room with you, I want them to stand up and I want them to walk over to you and to put their hand on your shoulder or your back or, or, or on your chest shoulder, back, chest, just, just put your hands on this man, on your father. Now, I want us to pray together. So I'm going to give you guys a moment. Everybody standing up? Are all the men standing? Hey, if you're a father, stand up. We're going to pray for you. Now, if you're by yourself and you're, you're a father and you're standing up in the middle of the room all by yourself, so put your hand right here. Just do this. And we're going to pray. Father God, I come before you right now. Look at each and every father that is standing up at this very moment. Lord, you know the trials. You know the tribulations. You know the, the circumstances in each of their lives. You know the stresses and you know the concerns that they may have. Father God, look at the times that we're living in. This is new to all of us. You know, with, 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 with COVID-19 and, and, and the, 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 the injustice um, uh, 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 things that are going on in our nation and the divide that's going on in our nation and, and a lot of hurt and pain and anger, all that, Father God. Look at the things that these fathers are having to live through and, and lead their homes through. Lord, I ask right now that you give them wisdom, a supernatural wisdom, that you give them discernment to continue leading their homes according to your word. Lord, that you give them each a passion now and a desire to submit to your word and to your direction and, and, and to be led by you. 
Father, look at these men standing up right now. I ask that you bless them and that you bless their families and that you reignite in each of them a fresh anointing, a passion to want to serve you. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, Lighthouse friends and family. Look forward to seeing you guys on Tuesday night prayer and Thursday night Bible study. God bless you. Have a good day.